guy asks this guy, Jim Woodford. So at this point, you don't even know you're dead. And he kind of laughs. He says, that's the good part. You know, it's like you're more alive than you've ever been. Well, welcome back to another episode of Encounters with God. I uh, have a very special guest and friend on today. He's a NDE expert, a near-death experience expert. He's got years of experience in this field. Uh, he's also a New York Times best-selling author. And even most recently, you may have seen him on the big screen. Uh, he was uh, brought in as an expert uh, witness to testify and so forth in the uh, Angel Studios, uh, Angel Studios' uh, new documentary, After Death. Well, uh, John, uh, how, how did that? Uh, welcome to the show. And, and how did the After Death experience uh, come about with the Angel Studios? Yeah, thanks for having me on again, Ken. Uh, well, about about seven years ago, um, I, right the year I, I wrote Imagine Heaven, um, which which was, you know, I was trying to basically show after 35 years of studying thousands of these near-death experiences. Uh, and and my, my whole thing has always been trying to understand how do the commonalities of what these people are saying, how's that align with scripture? And that's what Imagine Heaven was about, really showing that the anticipation of the life to come revealed in scripture is exactly what they're reporting. And the producer um, lost his brother-in-law and saw me on a Canadian TV show, got the book, read it, and contacted me and said, we got we to gotta do a movie. And at the time, I was actually in a contract with Netflix, which uh, ended up after two years going nowhere. Um, so I couldn't do anything with him. But I said, hey, you know, he, he, he was wanting to, you know, get the message out. And I was like, I'll help you in any way I can. So connected him to a lot of people. And then I didn't think anything was going to come of it, honestly. And five years later in COVID, he said, hey, can you come interview? And I was like, sure. And um, and then next thing I knew, you know, they got Angel Studios behind it. And, uh, it, you know, it's been nationally all across the country this last week. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It was, I went and saw it. It's excellent. Uh, and you could hear people in the lobby just talking about it. I heard one of the comments I heard was, I'm scared to die. Mm. you know so you, you had all type of reactions or wasn't that great don't we have something great to look forward to as christians yeah well and i think you know i think they did a great job of going to the point of showing the the medical evidence and even you know wrestling with people's skepticism that there is a life after death and there's and there's real evidence for it um you know it didn't go as far as my books do, um, you know, which is to help people understand the hope of heaven and especially who this God is that all these near-death experiencers are, are encountering all around the world. And of course, that's what I'm excited about, you know, is, is really helping people see the hope of, uh, of the message of Jesus. Yeah. Well, your, your title of the book, Imagine the God of Heaven, uh, why, why is it important the way we picture God or imagine God? Well, you know, Ken, um, without realizing it, all of us have God in a box, right? <laughs> because we're finite. You know, we're, we're, we're limited by three dimensions of, of, of space and one dimension of time. And yet very clearly, as I, as I show uh, in the books, there, what people are experiencing when they clinically die and, you know, some for minutes, some for hours, and then either modern medicine or miracle resuscitates them, brings them back. What they're clearly experiencing is a world of dimensionalities beyond our three dimensions of space and time in two to three dimensions of time. And, and of course, this is all in the scriptures. People don't realize it, but, you know, Second Peter uh, three eight. Um, Peter says to the Lord, "A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day." Well, in the ears, say almost exactly the same thing. Um, but the point of that is that they're trying they're trying to explain something beyond our dimensional realm, uh, and God is infinite. And, and there are all these attributes of God that we talk about or, or that we read about in Scripture. 
his, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. He's imminent and yet he's transcendent. I mean, these all these big words. And what I'm trying to do is help help people who don't believe in him at all come to see that there is incredible evidence for this God who loves every single person in every single nation. But also for the believer, I'm trying to help him or her expand their box and realize God is way more mysterious and glorious and powerful and sovereign, you know, all those big, huge words than we've ever imagined. But he's also on the other side of the box, far more personable and more relatable and with us and gets us and even a, a fun person, a funny person, which you know, some some Christians will hear that and go, no, wait, what? That's that's blasphemy. No, it's actually in scripture. And I'm trying to show people that the God who's revealed himself throughout history for 4,000 years is the God these indie ears are testifying to in every nation right now. Mm -hmm. And there just seems to be just, uh, he, he probably would, could give us a number, just an explosion of people reporting these now, not just here in the U.S., but across the globe. Yeah, and I'm I'm so convinced of that. You know, I, I believe that the Lord asked me to, I mean, I, I passed the leadership of the church that I started 25 years ago to really focus on this because I believe this is God's global apologetic it's it, it it is i believe it's the lord raising up witnesses in every nation and they're encountering when they clinically die they're encountering the same god that for 4000 years god's been revealing himself to be and you know in 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 imagine the god of heaven for instance i have the story of, of Santosh. So it's filled with, you know, 70 people from all around the world that, that the Lord has brought me that I interviewed for this book. Um, Santosh uh, was a manufacturing engineer, grew up in India. So he grew up Hindu. His dad was a Sanskrit scholar. Hinduism is all he knew. And yet when he hears code blue, code blue, his his pancreas had, uh, had, had ruptured basically and his heart stops, he leaves his body, he's seeing his body there from above, and then he says this brilliant God of light that he falls in love with, and this is a consistency, God, this God of light and love who is personal, but this light is not like the light of the sun, it's like a thousand times brighter, but easy to look at, this, this is commonly what they say, he takes Santosh on this journey to this place. And then Santosh describes to me this giant city. He calls it a huge compound or complex. Well, in India, they're compounds or high walled, you know, areas everywhere. Uh, we, we helped build a hospital there. So I've been there many times and I know, you know, that's, so he's explaining it, but what he's explaining and he, and he said, like is common, you can see for thousands of miles there, which in Imagine Heaven, I show that that's biblical too. It's in Revelation 21. And Santosh says this high walled compound, the walls were just gorgeous. And inside mansions, he said, and, and huge buildings of otherworldly building material and, and people. And he said, I counted 12 gates all around the city. I could see them all. I counted them. And I and I noticed angels outside the gates. And then I knew I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven. He, this is a Hindu saying this. And he longed to go into that place. And, you know, then he later has this vision of, of the almighty, he said, appearing now in the form of a, of a man, but huge on a throne and he looks into his eyes and they were eyes like lightning, which is exactly what Daniel described in Daniel chapter seven. It's what John describes in Revelation chapter one of the glorified risen Jesus, right? And he, and, and he sees his life review, which is another commonality. He sees all his sins. He had a vision of, of hell that he describes just like the Bible. He drops to his knees and says, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord. 
And then when this almighty God talks to him, he said it shocked him because his voice, he said, Santosh, I'm sending you back. And when you go back, I want you to love your family and especially your daughter. She needs your help right now. And he was so shocked because there was such love and tenderness and compassion and grace in his voice. And he knew what he deserved, but he was getting the opposite. And he sees a narrow gate right next to this throne and this narrow gate. He calls it a narrow gate or a narrow door that is open for him to go into the kingdom of heaven. And so after they have a conversation, he, he gets bolder and he says, Lord, when I come back, I want to go through that narrow gate. Tell me, how do I go through that narrow gate? Okay, so he goes back. Two years later, his daughter gets invited, and he's seeking. He's seeking with all his heart. He's like, who was this God? This was not the God I learned about in my religion. Who is this God of love and compassion and mercy and kindness and grace, even though justice? Because I saw, you know, I saw justice, and yet I got mercy. <laughs> And um, he goes, he walks in, to the, his daughter gets invited to sing in a choir at a church because she was a choral major. He goes to see her. And as he walks in, he feels the loving presence of that same God of light. And the message was on Matthew 7 about how the narrow is, is, the, is the road that, you know, that leads to life. And, and then on John 10, where Jesus says, I am the gate. I am the gate through which you must enter the kingdom of heaven. And Santosh went at home, starts reading the Bible. And he's like, everything I saw was right there. And so he becomes a follower of Christ. Now, that's one of 70 stories from every continent like that. Bibi in Tehran sees the same almighty glorified Jesus, doesn't know who he is, but he says to her, I am he who is. Okay. Now, again, this, this God of light, sometimes I see him as this man, uh, but, but brighter than the sun, right? And, and you have to recall, going all the way back, before any sacred scripture of any world religion was, was put down, God reveals himself, you know, first of all, to, to Abraham and Sarah, and he says, I'm, I'm going to raise you up into a nation. So he creates a nation, Genesis 12 to be a blessing to all the nations. And of course, the whole Bible ends, it's, it's a big love story. It's God's big love story. He creates us for a relationship. We reject relationship. He makes a plan to bless all nations. And in Revelation 7, John sees people there in heaven from every nation and tribe and people group and language. There around the throne, praising God, and then there's a great wedding. The whole thing's a big love story. And, and so what I'm showing is, you know, even here's, here's Bibi uh, in Tehran, and the same God of, of light and love who reveals himself to Moses as a brilliant light in a bush that wouldn't burn, right? And says, I am he who is. I am the I am. That's what Jesus said. Ego a me before Abraham was I am, right? So I'm just tracing throughout Scripture um, all how all these people uh, in Rwanda. I interviewed uh, a guy who was um, Muslim and an Imam. Uh, so he was literally a Muslim apologist, and he dies of blood cancer, and he comes back testifying that out of starting in a, in a hellish experience, Jesus comes into the room. He said, I knew who he was because I had seen the Passion of the Christ movie and he looked like that. He was a man with a beard and a robe with, he held out his hands and he said there were holes, big holes in his wrist. And he said to him, I died for mankind. You are among those I died for. Never deny it and tell everyone. And he comes back, he actually comes to 12 hours after dying of blood cancer. So overnight, he comes to and he realizes he's at someone's burial because there's a there's an open grave right there. But he doesn't realize it's his own burial. And and he sits up and everybody starts, you know, freaking out. And he says, 
Jesus is here and he's the one who brought me back. And he, is, he, he has had um, six attempts on his life since then because he won't stop talking about Jesus. And he's, you know, he was a Muslim uh, imam. So I have, I have stories like this from every continent. And these are professors, PhDs, spine surgeons, um, you know, people of other religions who have nothing to gain and a lot to lose saying what they're saying about in meeting this God. And yet they can't deny it because it's the most, they say it's the most real experience they've ever had in their life. They say this life is like the shadow. That's like the real thing. All our relationships are, are, are just a tiny taste of the real relationship that they say in his presence, this is the love I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. These kind of, when you started on this, uh, you, you were actually an agnostic. So it, these NDEs, as you started reading about them, I think your father was sick at the time. And um, so m maybe talk about that and, and how you see these NDEs as you're talking about when these people come back, they're changed. You know, some yeah, of them absolutely. go into the ministry, but it's such a powerful testimony. I mean, they are they're, they're not who who they were beforehand. Yeah, and Ken, you know, I I was uh, I was an engineer by education, and I worked in engineering, so I've always had a very skeptical, analytical mind, and it's why I was an agnostic because um, you know I had heard about Jesus and God and all this, but I was always like. But how do you know? You know, like, I don't see, I don't feel anything. I'm not. And I, that was always my question. Like, how do you know? And so I kind of thought Jesus was a legend. I didn't know if there was a God. I just didn't see any evidence. And um, and then my dad was dying of cancer. And someone gave him the very first research that coined the term near-death experience. And I read it in one night. And I said, oh, my gosh. Could this actually be scientific medical evidence? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wasn't convinced right away, but I was curious and it opened my mind to start actually being open to seeking God. And I read the Bible and I, and I started asking questions and I got answers and I came to faith. And over the last 35 years, I've, I've studied, you know, probably close to 1500 now, uh, you know, near death experiences. And, and so what's convinced me and what convinced many skeptical medical doctors uh, as well. And in chapter two of uh, Imagine the God of Heaven of the new book, I write about, um, about skeptics and, and NDEs and, and how what, what really convinced me. And for any alternative theory, because there are lots of alternative theories, um, but for any alternative theory of what these are to really stick, it needs to address these 10 points of evidence I go through. And that's what convinced me. These are real and these are something we have to consider. It's like testimony in a court of law. Mm -hmm. You know, so a principle of science is that anything consistently observed is real. Well, here we have uh you know a 2019 study done of 35 countries so the european academy of neurology reports on a study done of 35 countries and and they find out that one out of 20 people in these 35 countries has had a near death experience when they were near when they were clinically dead you know or or very close to clinical death now that's millions of people. We got a sample size of millions. I personally studied and interviewed, you know, uh, studied thousands. And, and yet consistently um, you hear of veridical evidence. So observations, when people leave their body, they are able to make observations of their resuscitation from up above their body uh, which they shouldn't have been able to make because they had no heartbeat, no brain waves. And, and, and yet when they come back into their body, they can report, um, you know, what they experienced and they can report things that can be checked out. And one study done, um, 
93 patients making multiple observations. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example, like um, in Imagine the God of Heaven, I report on a woman in London, has a near-death experience, leaves her body, has this incredible encounter with God. She was she was losing blood in pregnancy. She was afraid the, the baby died too. The Lord tells her, no, your baby's going to live. You need to go back. She goes back. And as she's coming back in the room, <laughs> this sounds crazy, I know, but there've been so many of these that checked out. As she's coming back in the room, she sees on the top side of the ceiling fan, a red sticker and is able to read it too, comes back into her body. And then she starts to tell all the doctors and nurses this amazing experience. Nobody will believe her. Um, finally, she tells one nurse what the nurse said during, you know, while she was unconscious and the nurse was kind of shocked. And she said, I'll prove it to you. Get a ladder and go look on the top side of the ceiling fan and you'll see a red sticker. And here's what it says. And finally, the nurse and an orderly do that. And sure enough, that's what it is. Now, there have actually been studies done. So Dr. Janice Holden studied 93 NDE patients who claimed to make, and any one might make five observations or 10 observations. So observations out of their body having an NDE. And what she found is 92% of their observations were 100% correct. 92% accurate about how resuscitation was done, all these medical procedures, who said what. Uh, another 6% were mostly accurate. So one or two things they might not have been able to line up. Only 2% were inaccurate. Turns out there it was one patient who just was, was off. And they compared that to asking cardiac arrest patients, what do you think happened while you were unconscious? And it was like guessing, like they were just saying what they saw in ER. Well, that, that, that's one of the things I think that uh, when these people come back and they can describe in detail is one of the really convincing things to me when I uh, hear their stories, read their stories, read your books, is they know too much that they shouldn't know at all. Yeah. And the knowledge that they have, they couldn't have acquired it had they not uh, died or gone out of their body or they had some type of experience with God, gone to heaven. Um, it, it just, you can't explain that. Yeah. And, and in, in imagine the God of heaven, I'm focusing in on, so it's, it's a comp, it's a book about God. And I'm, I'm showing the love story of God told throughout history through the scriptures, because if you miss that, you really miss understanding you know, a lot of the questions we ask, why does God remain so hidden? Why does God allow suffering? Where is God when I'm hurting? Why isn't he answering my prayers? And yet the, the, the mystery of what these indie ears say ties to the scriptures and helps give us confidence. Oh, he is with me. He is hearing my every prayer. He is working and, you know, and, and helping us really gain peace in the midst of so much, uh, you know, times of trouble and confusion, but also all of the, you know, the heart of God conveyed through scripture and the characteristics of God um, conveyed through scripture. They are, they are showing that in an overlapping way. So I'm showing you, you know, some of these mysteries that we, we see and we talk about in, in, in scripture, like God is imminent meaning he is everywhere all the time. And yet he's transcendent. He's beyond the creation and, and how they, how they talk about, about this, um, the Trinity, there's only one God. Uh, and yet throughout history, God has revealed himself in three persons, father, son, and spirit. Now what's wild is when you hear uh, Heidi who at the time of her near-death experience was a 16-year-old girl raised Jewish by an atheist dad who every day had this mantra that he would tell his three girls, there is no God, your life is worthless, Jesus is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. <laughs> this is every day. Hmm. And yet despite, and, and it was a kind of abusive household, and as a result, she actually believed in God from when she was a child and prayed to God every night and felt every night that God was there with her, comforting her and putting her to sleep as a child. Hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. So when you hear Heidi, when her horse falls on her and crushes her, she's up 30 feet above her body. She knows she's dead. This brilliant light is shining. She turns and looks and she said, there was Jesus. And she said, I wasn't like, what is a good Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus? I shouldn't be with Jesus. She said, no, I knew him. She said, I knew him. I knew this man was the God I'd been praying to my whole life. And she said, he showed me that. He showed me in my life review that when I was praying to him as a child, he was sitting there by my bed. Hmm. Amen. Now, is that crazy? But but then you, you he takes Heidi to, you know, they, they take off and they go. And he takes her to this place of, she describes as infinite light, that is love. And then the next thing she knows, she is with God the Father. But she says, but he was also Jesus, but Jesus was also separate. And she says, now don't, don't make me explain how God can be light and God can be love and God can be a man. I, I, I can't explain it, but that's what I experienced. Now, when you have someone who absolutely shouldn't understand, you know, what Jesus said, you know, I mean, John says God is love, right? Jesus demonstrated God's love. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they see Jesus as this brilliant light brighter than the sun. I mean, on and on and on you go. And when you have Heidi describing the Trinity, and then another girl, Suzanne Seymour, who um, when, when she died, she was, I, I, I believe she was 12. So she was even younger. And she says, Jesus, who she didn't really know that well, she just heard about him. He comes and gets her and takes her to this beautiful heavenly place. They're sitting under a tree together. And she said he was just like the most loving father you can imagine, or like a big brother that you just felt so comfortable with. And then he says to her, you know, I'm actually much more than you see right now. And then he shows her what she described. She said, you know, all those words in the Bible now, the, the glory of God, the holiness of God, the omnipresence and omnipotence of God. She said, I saw that. And she describes and she says that merged with Jesus. And she said, all those words are trying to describe something. But all I could say is, whoa, just whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And it just, you know, again, it just expands the box that we, you know, inevitably put God in. But I think what it does for you is, is, is helps you understand, at least by analogy, a few of these mysteries. Yeah. Like the Trinity. So, it, you know, we say, we say the Trinity or, you know, people who are skeptical say the Trinity is a contradiction because in our world, three persons can never be one. What I show is how many of these NDEs say, but in heaven, it's not even a question. How can three be one? How can three persons be one? It's not even a question. It's, it's self-evident. So I give an analogy in the book that imagine if I created a flat two-dimensional world, okay? So people can only move side to side and forward and back, there, there, there isn't even an up or down. There's no third dimension. They don't have an up or down. Okay. So now imagine I, as the creator, stick my three fingers into their world. So I, I, I cross their two-dimensional plane. They would see me as three separate circles in their two-dimensional world. Right? You following? I'm following. But what if I, if I told them I'm not actually three separate circles, I'm actually one being. But in two dimensions, three separate circles can never be one because they can't stack up my arm into one being because there's no up. So what if by analogy, you know, in the extra dimensionality of the creator beyond our three dimensions, somehow father, son, and spirit stack up, you know, into one being. And that's exactly what indie ears are telling us. It might not make sense in our finite dimensions of time and space, 
but it actually, and there was only one God. They said, they're, they're not three. So Dean Braxton um, said to me, and, and, and Randy Kay, a CEO, also said to me in their near-death experience, like when I was talking to the Father, I knew I was also talking to the Holy Spirit and talking to Jesus. And I knew they are individual, but not separate. They're, they're one. He said, it's, it's not one like we count one and, and that's it. And so, so we, we go into all these mysteries um, and, the, and the majesty and the glory of God, but we also go into the, the, the personal side and the relatability of God. And that's, you know, that's my favorite part because I think so many people really fail to understand how personable God is and how really God is the love you've always wanted. And not only that, the relationship that no relationship on earth can ever fully meet, can ever fully satisfy. Mm, yeah, that's good. I, I guess one of the passages that, that a lot of uh, Christians or people that study the Bible uh, see that might have a parallel to this would be when First Corinthians was Paul's talking about a, a, a man that went up to the third heaven. What uh, uh, what is what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that this is a, a an NDE type experience of Paul or? You know, I don't know for sure, but we do know that uh, in Acts chapter fourteen, Paul was a crowd turned on him in Lystra and stoned him to death. And they knew how to do that back then. Right? Yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, when, when someone's had enough stones on them that they 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 seem to be dead, they dragged him out of town and left him for dead. The believers rallied around him and prayed for him. And somehow he revives enough to even go back in and keep going, which yeah, is they, great. Yeah, they were shocked. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think that was a miraculous re resuscitation. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, that 14 years, he's talking about himself, 14 years ago, he says, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know, which I think he says that because we still have a spiritual body. And it's a lot of these indie ears say, you know, I like I asked this guy, Jim Woodford. So at this point, you don't even know you're dead. And he kind of laughs. He says, that's the good part. You know, it's like you're more alive than you've ever been. Yeah. And, and so Paul says, whether in my body or out of my body, I don't know, but I was taken up into heaven and I heard and saw things inexpressible and, and things that no one's allowed to tell. And in the ears also talk about the same thing. They, they, they talk about some things that are inexpressible, like Typically, there are colors beyond our color spectrum, they, colors they can't even describe, or or every shade, thousands of shades of red, and you can see them all. So things like that. Um, but they also say things like, in God's presence, uh, like, you know, I have one story, uh, a whole chapter on, you know, suffering and the sovereignty of God, you know, and that mystery. And... Uh, I, I interviewed uh, a doctor, a, a, a plastic surgeon, Dr. Uh, Mark Madonna, who died in a fire. Um, he, he helped uh, two of his brothers escape, but his mother and his youngest brother died in the fire. And while he was trying to rescue them, he, he got like 80% of his body had, you know, fourth degree burns, just horrible. And um and when he died on the way to the hospital, he's there in the presence of God with his mother and brother. And he said, it was just like we were, we were all cozied up on the couch, you know, watching TV together. It was just so natural. And the Lord's there. And he saw God's plan. And all he could say was, of course, of course, that makes so much sense. Of course. And, and, and he said, Jesus said to him, you're going to go back because I still have a purpose for your life. And it's not going to be easy, but we're going to do it together. And I, and I chronicle how Mark comes back and it was, oh, I mean, you want to talk about suffering in life, you know, 38 surgeries, reconstructive 
surgeries. He's a 16 year old without a mother and he lost his brother and he's, he's marred all over his face and his body. I mean, as a teenager, and then his father goes into depression and ends up becoming an alcoholic. And then he goes off to college and, you know, realizes alcohol can numb what he later discovered as PTSD symptoms he was having. And, but through that all, he, he gets into recovery, turns back to the Lord and he gains he realizes he has the ability to help others, ends up becoming a plastic surgeon who can both bring empathy to patients and can help reconstruct burn patients. But what I'm showing in that is that, you know, there are mysteries like when God says he's working all things together for those who love him. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And, and yet Mark and these others come back and they say, you know, I can't tell you all that I saw. So just like Paul said, you know, some things that no man is allowed to tell. And they'll commonly say that, but they'll say, but there I knew it. I understood it, which, which gives us confidence. Like, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you, even though I don't see it. I don't get it. I don't understand what you're doing. And yet you tell me, you know, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 7, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. You know, commit your ways to him and, and, and do it. And he will make your, you know, your reward shine like the, the brightness of the sun. And that's what's going to happen. And so we can trust what God has revealed in scripture and these indie ears help us trust him and, and love him more because we see that he is with us and he is working something out. And, and another one, Ken, that I love in the last section of the book, doing life with the God of joy and laughter. I also talk about the, the prayers of heaven, like indie ears see prayers going to the father and they see the father answering those prayers. And, um, you know, this one guy that I interviewed, Jim Woodford, who, who was an agnostic or really, I mean, he wasn't an atheist per se, but he said he had never once prayed to God. And he said, I was just too arrogant and self-consumed. So he was a commercial airline pilot. So again, these people I'm interviewing, they have no reason to say these crazy stories. They don't line up with where they were coming from. He was, he owned several multi-million dollar businesses. He he had a horse farm because he loved horses. He had an airplane, a boat, and a garage with 17 British sports cars. And he said, you know, I I just I just didn't need God, didn't see proof of God. And yet he gets Guillain Barre, which is a painful, painful autoimmune disease. And he gets addicted to opioids. His wife was a believer praying for him and praying for his salvation. And he overdoses in his truck accidentally, but he, he then realizes, I'm dying. He said, you're, you know when you're dying. And as his head is hitting the steering wheel, he realizes I've never thanked God for all the blessings I've been given. Like he hadn't thought about that. And he, and he just said, Lord, forgive me. And boom, his head hits the steering wheel. And I joke with Jim, Jim, I think you beat the thief on the cross for last minute salvation. <laughs> and it, what's interesting, Ken, is in a lot of these stories where people um, cry out to God at the very last minute, God also gives them a vision of the reality of hell, of the reality of a place where, and 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 I go into that the 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 love where the love and justice of God meet. Um, that's a whole chapter in the book because, you know, hell, hell people so misunderstand hell. Hell is not created as a place to punish us for our sins. God did not create hell for people. Mm -hmm. It was created for eternal angels. It's God giving creatures that he created to love him free will because you can't love without free will. But that means we have to be free even to reject the love of our creator. 
which is crazy. If you know the creator and you know his unique love for you, it's crazy to reject him. And yet we can, it's a real possibility, but not what God wants at all. And, and so they, they see the reality of this place where free willed people and angels are free to rule when they don't want God's rule. But that's like the worst prison scene imaginable, right? Where everyone's trying to dominate or be dominated. My will be done. I don't want God's will. So anyway, Jim gets a, a, a view of that and then God rescues him and from it. And, uh, and he's, he's walking with these angels, one of which he found out was his guardian from his conception. And, and, and he talks about how God loves to delight us in heaven. I mean, he, he said, I don't, I didn't deserve anything. And, and, and yet, you know, Psalm 37, four, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, you know, as a pastor, I, I used to think that was just kind of metaphorical. Like we don't get everything we desire on this earth. Right. Uh, and, and yet m the more indie ears that I've interviewed, the more I think maybe it's more literal for the life to come because Jim First of all, as a commercial airline pilot, one of the angels says, Jim, touch my robe. And he touches his robe. And the next thing he knows, he's up flying above the same holy city that Santosh described, that John in the book of Revelation described. You know, he's describing the same thing. And he said, it was like he was giving me a, a flyover like I had done in huge cities around the world. And he was showing me his city from a, a pilot's perspective. Well, what's even more cool is I interviewed another commercial airline pilot, Captain Dale Black, and God gave him the same aerial flyover. <laughs> he loves to give us the delight of our heart. Well, so then Jim comes back down and he they, they walk, they're walking this path. They come to the split rail fence and the angel says, Jim, look. And, and he said, you know, my love on earth was, was horses. He had a horse farm. And out from behind these trees in heaven, here come these three beautiful white Arabian horses. And he said, I'd never read the Bible. I, did, I, I didn't know Jesus comes back riding a horse, <laughs> riding a white horse, you know? And um, and honestly, you know, Ken, uh, I thought a lot of that was, was just metaphor. I really did. But hearing story after story when people are clinically dead who didn't even know the bible saying the same things it's changed my mind and i've started to realize that heaven and god are far better than i could have ever imagined mm -hmm. yeah it's really just a confirmation of the scriptures isn't it it completely is you know and that's that's what i you know i'm trying to show in that last section is that a lot of us don't fully trust God. And the reason is, is because secretly in the back of our minds, we think, well, if I really trust him, like if I really do his will, I'm going to miss out. Yeah. I'm not going to, he's going to, he's going to not, you know, I'm not going to have a very enjoyable life. I'm not going to have fun in life. I'm going to miss this or I'm going to miss that. And I'm telling you, you're not going to miss a thing. Nothing. And, and these people talk about, you know, so Jim talks about how um, God longs to delight us. Uh, Randy, the CEO, who when he dies of blood clots in his leg going and blocking his lungs and then he, his body shuts down. So he has medical proof of 30 minutes, 30 minutes dead. Um, and yet the CEO comes back testifying about how, you know, he cries out to Jesus. Um, he, he was a believer, but he was really struggling, cries out to Jesus, and he's there with him. And he said the, he was embracing him. And he could feel, I mean, you feel, you're real. This is a real thing. He felt his whiskers, the Lord's whiskers on his cheek. And he said to him, trust me, beloved. Because Randy had struggled with trust. 
And then as they're, as they're walking, Randy again gets this life review. He called it like vignettes of his life in the past. And he had had a really difficult childhood. Um, so, so growing up, he was overweight. He had horrible asthma that put him in the hospital a lot. Um, so he got bullied a lot. Uh, he ended up um, having one friend who then gets beaten up and then they move away. So Casey, his little fox terrier dog was his only friend. And, and he said, you know, Casey would come and jump on me and lick my face like a lollipop. And, you know, he, he was my best friend. And then Casey died in college. And Jesus is showing him these vignettes of growing up and all of the, the pain of growing up. And, um, and he says to Jesus, why are, why are you showing me this? And then he, it dawns on him. He said, were you there with me even in that? And, and, and Jesus says to him, and, and Jesus has a tear, he said, which, which is interesting because I've had people say, but, but I thought Revelation said no more tears in heaven. No, we are alive like we're alive here. There are tears. It's just that the Lord wipes them all away. There, he, because there, he, he's healing all the sorrows of earth. But he went through it with us. And that's what he was showing Randy. He said, I was always there with you. Then he shows him another vignette when he was an agnostic and he was a medical executive and a CEO of biotech firms that he started. And, and um, he's a, he's an orderly in a hospital and this little boy is dying of cancer and he comes in to serve him. And the boy says, I'm dying, but I'm going to heaven. And, and then he asked him, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, no, I don't really believe in that. But if there's a heaven, I'm sure you'll go there. And the little boy said, I'm going to pray for you. You'll be in heaven one day. And he's watching with Jesus this scene acted out again in his life. And he's realizing that Jesus is showing him the power of prayer, that that little boy praying for him worked things that God used in Randy's life to later help him see. Now, he, he doesn't force our free will, but he does respond to our prayers. And so now Randy is in heaven, what that boy said. And in answer, in part to his prayers, he is in heaven. And Jesus says to him, look, and he, and he, and he turns like this. And here comes across this beautiful meadow of flowers, Casey, his little dog that died in college, runs up, jumps up on him, licks his face like a lollipop. So it's all real, you know? It's, it's not eternal death. It's eternal life. And people so miss this. And, and we've got to stretch our imagination. But what, what, what Jesus says to him is, see, I give you the desires of your heart. I give you the desires of your heart. And, and person after person that I interviewed, they say things like this. And you just realize, oh my gosh, why, why would I ever turn away from God? Because joy, like C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. And if you recall, the God of the scriptures is the same God that told Israel seven times a year, I want you to throw a big street party, big festival and celebrate with joy unto the Lord. That's Leviticus. <laughs> and then Jesus, last night on earth, John chapter 15, he said, just stay connected to me. Just walk with me. It's exactly what he told Santosh, by the way. I want you to walk with me and you will bear much fruit. And then in John 15, he says, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy will overflow. And in, and, and in the book, I talk about how, you know, what these indie ears show us and what ties to the scriptures is that if you are a believer, joy is your birthright. And it's not circumstantial. Joy is dependent on staying connected moment by moment, day by day with the Lord. And it's simpler than you realize. And then those circumstances may be bad. And though we may still suffer, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. 
And yet there is a joy that's available even through that. And that's what indie ears remind us of. Yeah, I think what you talked about in the very beginning was imagine the God of heaven is uh, a lot of people just have a wrong concept. It's not a biblical, you know, approach to God or understanding of God. You know, they have this serious God who's got a big club. He's fixing to whack me over the head if I step out of line. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you hope that people get from this book? I mean, Ken, I hope that people who don't believe, I don't see how they can not believe after. I think you have to keep a pretty hard heart. Uh, and you got to ask yourself, why don't I want there to be a God of such love who loves me so intimately? Why would I not want that God in my life? But I think for those who do believe, it's going to just blow your, your mind in a way that you're like, I want to trust you more, Lord. Help me day by day walk with you more and trust you more and have that peace and that confidence that you do have a purpose for my life and you are fulfilling it because I am walking with you. Not perfectly, we never do. And I talk about that too. And to experience his joy more and more. That's what I pray for people. Hmm. Very good. Well, we'll put your book in the show notes. Uh, if, if people want to contact you, uh, how can they reach out to you, John? Yeah, either um, johnburkonline.com or you can go to imaginethegodofheaven.com. So just the book title, imaginethegodofheaven.com. All right. It's been a pleasure once again, John. Thank you so much for your time. I'll be praying for you, brother, and I pray this book just goes out and reaches uh, the masses. Well, thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me on the show again. It's been a pleasure.